Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Well, welcome to CCC's live stream, and uh, I'm Matt Rawlings, Pastor Matt. Here in a minute, we'll be jumping into the Gospel of Luke. We'll be in chapter 12. We'll go from verse 4 through 21. So while you're getting your Bible app open or grabbing uh, your Bible, let me just run a few things by you before we jump in. And so, number one, remember that um, during the week, we're still trying to do a lot of stuff uh, online. So tomorrow night, Monday night, I should say, uh, what is that, April 26th or 27th, I guess, uh, it's coming up. Um, Monday night at 7 o'clock, I'll be on Facebook Live doing another session of Ask Pastor Matt, fielding your questions, doing my best to answer them. already had a question come in yesterday, and so send some more in if you, if you like. Any questions about the faith that you may have? So that will be tomorrow night, Tuesday night um, at 6.30. Megan will be leading the women's devotional and prayer meeting via Zoom. Wednesday night um, at 7, I'll be doing the same with the men via Zoom. Thursday night via Zoom. Uh, Mom, hopefully, will be feeling better. She had to cancel last week, but hopefully, we'll be doing women's Bible study at 6 o'clock Thursday night. And then Friday night, Andrew uh, will be talking to the students via Zoom and doing a class that way. So, also, if you're not a Christian and you're watching this, first of all, thank you. You're, You're welcome to do so, of course. Glad you're here. If you have any questions about anything at all to do with the faith, or you're thinking about, you know, placing your faith in Jesus Christ, please feel free to send me an email. My email address is pastormattr at yahoo.com, P-A-S-T-O-R-M-A-T-T-R at yahoo.com. Try to help you the best that I, you know, just possibly can. Now, before we jump into this, a little bit of context. First, you know, I would love it if I was able to connect all of Luke 11 and 12, because they do kind of all belong together. But, you know, because you guys aren't going to sit still for a three-hour sermon, I had to kind of break this up a little bit. But essentially what's going on in these chapters is Jesus is preparing his disciples. Remember that we saw in Luke 9.51, Jesus say that he set his face toward Jerusalem, or Luke say that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. In other words, he committed that he was going to complete his father's mission, and he was going to go to the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of anyone who places faith in him, and that, that he would die, and then three days later he would rise, and then he would appear to his disciples. And so he's preparing his disciples because after his resurrection, of course, as we'll see when we get into the book of Acts later in the year, he ascends back to heaven to his heavenly throne. And he leaves the disciples, though not alone, because the, when he, once he dies and rises again, the Spirit is unleashed, and the Spirit fill and guide the disciples in establishing the early church. But... It is not just the Spirit alone, and the disciples aren't just robots, and and Jesus is teaching them. He's preparing them to become church leaders, to become better disciples. And so last week what we saw is that he was having dinner, he and his disciples, with some Pharisees and scribes. Uh, The Pharisees were one of the many sects within Judaism in the first century. And he took them to task for being hypocrites, for loving attention, and all that kind of stuff. And then we see that in, and and Jesus comes out, and he sees the large crowds coming to to come to him to see miracles or healing or hear teaching. And he turns to his disciples and says, "Uh, beware, don't you become like them. You know, they like the limelight, and they like money, and they like all that kind of stuff. They like fine clothes. And then he says, don't be like that. Because as soon as the crowds show up, and you get attention, it can go to anyone's head. And it could become all about that person. I've seen that, sadly, too often in my life. I've been doing ministry now for 21 years. This is my 21st year in ministry. My ministry is now old enough to drink. And so what I have seen that, though, I've seen pastor after pastor get a big following and then flame out. Because too often the pastor got to like the attention, got a big ego, liked the money and all that other kind of stuff, 
and it was a disaster. And Jesus is warning his disciples against that. What he's going to do this morning is he's going to talk about two things, but they're connected. And if you know, if, you, if you've been forced to listen to me preach, you know, you know that what, one of the things I like to do is to show you how Scripture connects. So in the Gospel of Luke, think of it this way. Luke is preaching a Gospel sermon. You know, it's 24 chapters long, but it, it does flow, and there are several reoccurring themes and threads through there that you have to pick out in order to truly understand Luke's Gospel. And so this morning he's going to talk about The fear of God versus the fear of men. And he's going to talk about money. And those two do connect, and we'll see. We'll see how they connect. But first he's going to talk about money. And I know that none of you want to hear me talk about money. But here's the deal. It's not Matt talking about money. It's Jesus talking about money. And Jesus talks about money a lot, especially in the Gospel of Luke. And there's a very good reason why. So let's jump in. 12.4. 12.4. Here we go. <clears throat> and I'm using my own translation again, but you should be able to follow easy enough with whatever Bible translation you have. I tell you, my friends, remember he's talking to his disciples, do not fear those who can destroy the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you who you should fear. Fear him who after destruction has the power to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. He's telling people, here's what he's saying. And it looks like he's going to contradict himself here in a second, but he's not. He's saying that when it comes down to it, one, he is preparing his disciples that they will face opposition. They will face persecution, even unto death. In fact, we will see, if you read all the Gospels, you will see Jesus tells his disciples, with the 11 remaining after Judas commits suicide, he tells them, he says, basically, Peter, the rest of you, you're going to die horrible deaths. And they did. If church history is is right, and we have no reason to doubt it, Peter was crucified upside down. Matthew, all the early disciples were killed at a fairly young age, with the exception of John. John lived to be quite an old man, but the rest of them were murdered for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were martyred. And Jesus is telling them, "Don't, don't fear that. What can they do? They can take your life but then, if, once they take your life, where do you go? You go and stand before God. When you stand before God, you'll know. It's better to fear God than to fear people. And sometimes I hear this. When the Bible says, talks about the fear of God, it means just the awe of God. Well, yes, we're to awe, be in awe of God. That is true. But the Greek word here, phobeto, where we get phobia, means fear. Knee-knocking fear. And you see this in the Bible. Go back to Isaiah, when Isaiah is taken, you know, and he's kind of given a glimpse of the heavenly throne. And just that glimpse terrifies him. To be in the presence of the holy, all-powerful God can be a fearful thing. Especially if you haven't been faithful. And that's what Jesus is, is saying here. Fear God. A person can just take your life. But as my mom is fond of saying, this life that we're living here on earth right now, it's the shortest period of eternity. We have an entire eternity to think about. Think about that every day. Verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for a trifle? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, what's he saying here? He says, says, on the one hand, he says fear. On the other hand, he says don't fear. What is he talking about? He's talking about, again, when you come under persecution, when you come under fire for your faith, he says, it'll be okay. Don't fear people, because God can do more to you than these people can. But understand that if you're faithful, know that God is loving and good. He cares for you. Don't worry. He he will give you what you need to complete your mission. And nobody but you and God, and sometimes just God, knows what your mission is or how long it will last. My wife and I have this conversation all the time. Is this what we should be doing? We ask ourselves that sometimes. Should we be doing this or this when when it comes down to our ministry? 
And the other day, something popped in my head that a professor told me many years ago, much wiser than me, and I told her, if you're serving the kingdom of God, you're doing God's will. Always. No matter how big it is, how successful it is, any that kind of stuff. Understand that God knows what you're doing. Even the hairs on your head are counted. The reason he uses this, the five sparrows thing, sparrows were the cheapest thing you could buy in an ancient Jewish market. The poor often lived off sparrows. I can't even imagine what that tastes like. But the, he's saying, okay, if God even knows exactly what's going on with the lowliest of creatures, how much more so with you? He knows, he sees, he's there. So do not be afraid. When Jesus says do not be afraid, he's talking about those who will oppose them. Now, few of us face opposition today. Not this kind of opposition. We're not looking to get thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. Not here. And it still does happen in other parts of the world, but not here. And what we, and it pains me to say this, what we fear are not getting likes or being thought of as being some kind of weirdo because we're Christians? That's what we fear? Is that really something to fear? But if we live with our eternal lives in view and remember that God can do more to us than any human being can, that even if they slander us, even if they call us crazy, in the end, pleasing God is all that matters. And so be faithful to him. Verse 8. I tell you, whoever professes me before others, the Son of Man will acknowledge or confess him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. And any, any, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks slander against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. All right, it sounds again like Jesus is, is talking out of both sides of his mouth, but he's not. What he's saying is this. He's saying that he's talking about the life lived. You know, especially if you call yourself a Christian, but you don't stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't stand up for the lordship of Jesus Christ, then Jesus has every right to ask you whether or not you truly had faith in him when you stand before him one day. But when he says those who slander me now or deny me now, those will be forgiven. He's talking to his disciples because he knows what's going to happen. A little spoiler alert. When Jesus goes to the cross, his disciples scatter. They don't have his back. They're gone. Their idea of a Messiah was not one who would be arrested, you know, by, by the Jewish authorities and crucified by the Romans. That is not what they had in mind. They believed he was another false Messiah, and there had been many in Israel. And so they snuck away, hiding behind locked doors, afraid they were next. And yet Jesus forgives them. He famously forgives Peter three times, restores Peter for denying him three times. But he says, those who slander the Spirit, <coughs> those who speak against the Spirit, those who resist the Holy Spirit, those will not be forgiven. What does he mean by that? Here's what he means. You are given, whenever you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, an opportunity to choose. To choose for Jesus or against Jesus. If you deny those opportunities before you die, and I don't care what your theology is. There are some among us who are Calvinists who say that you know, you're selected by God for a secret reason that he does not reveal and that your heart is regenerated. And then once your heart is regenerated, then, then you will choose Jesus Christ because you'll see him as, as more beautiful and more wonderful than anything else. Others who are Arminians or free will say that in the preaching of the gospel itself, that the Holy Spirit pervades that in what John Wesley called prevenient grace, and that this prevenient grace is able to melt the heart so that you can freely decide. If you decide against, regardless of what your theology is, there is no more grace. There is no more grace. 
The gospel is the most decisive moment. If you hear the gospel preach, it is the most decisive moment in your life. And as we'll see, we don't know when our lives will end. Given the opportunity to repent and believe in Jesus Christ should always be taken because we don't know what tomorrow brings. We just don't know. So that's what he's talking about, resisting the Spirit and the Spirit-filled preaching of the gospel. Verse 11, when you're dragged before synagogues and rulers, now notice he says, he doesn't say if you are dragged before synagogues and rulers. He says when. When you are dragged before synagogues and rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will make your defense when speaking, for the Holy Spirit will instruct you at that time how you should speak. Now, understand something here. Jesus is not saying that no preacher should prepare a sermon, that no person should practice um, apologetics and a gospel witness to other people and how to have um, conversations that can lead to someone coming to faith in Jesus Christ. He's not saying that. He's not saying that the Spirit will just zap you and give you their words. He's noticed he's telling the disciples when you're dragged before synagogues, rulers, authorities, in other words, a court proceeding. Don't worry about it because just then, just like now, there were all kinds of rules and, and, and the legal system had its own vocabulary and so forth. And he's saying, don't worry about that. Don't worry that, you know, you're being dragged here and you're going, wait a minute, do I get an attorney? He said, don't worry about all the legalese and the formalities and all the other kind of stuff when you're persecuted. God is there, and the Spirit will help you. And we see this happen in the book of Acts. When we get to Acts, we'll see Peter and John hauled before the Sanhedrin. We will see Peter, or Paul, again and again on trial. And every time, what do they do? Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. Preparing is fine. He's just allaying their fears that they're not going to be alone when persecution comes. Now, someone in the crowd, and remember from last week, this is a large crowd that has gathered around Jesus. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But verse 14, Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Now, this sounds strange, and he's going to use this here. He's going to say, then he said to them, his disciples, watch out, guard yourself against every form of greed. A person's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. Where's he going with that? Here's the deal. First of all, the person in the crowd calling out to Jesus, hey, decide this. My brother's got the inheritance, and he's not wanting to split it up. Tell him to get moving. I want my money. Now, it sounds like the guy is being greedy, and it sounds like the guy is being rude. But in fact, it was common practice in Israel and fairly common practice within Judaism today for family squabbles, family fights to be settled by a rabbi. But Jesus says, I'm not getting involved in that. And it's not because Jesus sees it completely as unimportant or whatever, but because Jesus is on mission. He is marching to Jerusalem, he is going to his death, and he's not going to be detoured by someone else's problems that don't have to do with his mission at hand. But he does use this episode to turn and talk again to the disciples about greed, the danger of greed, and telling them life is not about stuff. Again, Remember what he was saying earlier. We need to live our lives as Christians with eternity in view. This life is kind of our testing ground for what comes next. And I tell you the truth. When you stand before Christ in judgment, you will look back at this life, however many years you have been given, and you will think only one thing, I wish I had done more. And one of, one of the jobs that I have for those of you who are already Christians 
I used to beg with you, plead with you, live your lives with the shadow of eternity there, with eternity in purview, with judgment in purview, with the fear of God at your heart, so it'll motivate you to do more every single day. He with the most toys does not win. And he goes on to illustrate it this way in verse 16 with a parable. And then he told them a parable. He said, a wealthy man had a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I don't have room to store all of it. And he said, ah, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my crops and all my goods. Now, so far, so good. In this parable, so far, there's no judgment on this man, is there? Jesus isn't saying that he's a crooked man. Jesus isn't saying that he's come through his wealth by ill-gotten gains. And despite what some people say, Jesus does not condemn wealth in and of itself. He may tell the rich young ruler that he needs to sell all of his possessions, but he doesn't tell everybody that. It depends on the person. But let's keep going, see what the problem is. Verse 19, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of things stored away. Take it easy, eat, drink, party. But God said to him, you fool, or you idiot. This very night, your life will be taken from you. Then, who will get what you have stored? And this is how it would be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not generous with God. Here's the problem. The problem is, this man had this huge crop. Now, how do you get a huge crop in ancient Israel? They don't, they didn't really understand agriculture like we do. They didn't have super foods or seeds from Monsanto. They didn't have, if you had a good crop, it was because the weather was good. Well, who controls the weather? This abundance was given to him by God. But does he praise God? Does he thank God? Does he look to God and say, I, I have all this extra, what shall I do? Give it to the poor? Store it for later on? What shall I do? No. He says, ah, now I'm just going to sit back, relax, and have a good time. And God himself says to the man, you don't even understand. Your time's come to an end. None of us know when our time is. Only God knows. And in the meantime, when we are given some kind of blessing from God, we need to praise him for it. I see it too often. You know, in the places I've worked, I've seen people become very successful, and most of them become very self-centered and arrogant. And they don't give God credit for any of it. It's, they're just like, eh, it's me. Well, you may have talents and, and, and so forth, and you may be hardworking and disciplined, but where did that come from? You didn't create your own DNA, bub. You were knitted together in your mother's womb by God himself. Anything good that comes into your life, you should praise God for. And you should seek wisdom on how to use it. If you have an abundance, and too, too few of us have an abundance, it's not because we're not making good money. It's because we spend too much. We spend too much. We define too many things as necessities when they're really luxuries. And as a result, we're always scraping by and we don't have enough money stored away to help those, especially our brothers and sisters that we worship with who are in need. And that's a shame. And it's something we all need to rectify. But why is it that Jesus goes from talking about persecution to talking about money. There's a reason. They are connected. You tell people long enough and loud enough that following Jesus Christ, despite what a lot of preachers on, on, on the internet and, and the TV say, that the Christian faith is all about that you coming to this faith where God just wants you to have all kinds of possessions and he wants you to be liked 
and he wants you to be successful and have a long life. Now, where they're getting that, I don't know, because Jesus has said the exact opposite. So despite what they say, if you, if you actually preach and teach what Jesus taught, which is that following him may very well lead to a, to a life full of persecution and trouble, What's the temptation going to be? The temptation is going to try to soften that as much as you possibly can by making yourself as comfortable as you possibly can. I understand that even though we are close to the buckle of the Bible belt here in Appalachia, that the culture has changed and that a minister of the gospel like myself is not welcomed in most areas. People don't want to hear it. Some people get very angry if you begin to talk about Jesus Christ. And I've tried to be very open and honest with you. The temptation I wrestle with most as a 40-something-year-old man I don't have any temptation to go party. I don't have any temptation toward any of that stuff. Sounds like way too much work, and I ain't got nearly that much energy. My temptation is to stay home and be comfortable. I like to be comfortable. I like my couch. I like my TV. I don't live in a fancy house. I live in a fairly old, small house. But... It's got a good heater and a good air conditioner. I've got, I don't know how many channels, and Netflix and Amazon Prime. I've got a library full of books. I've got a refrigerator full of pizza and bacon, you know, the essentials. I've got all that stuff. And I am perfectly happy, thank you very much, to spend my days, even when I'm not quarantined, sitting on my couch, studying, and justifying that I'm doing something for the Lord by studying, even though I like to study because I'm a nerd, and watching movies, and eating pizza, and perfect 72 degrees. But then, I don't know. The Lord may be saying to me, fool, this is the last night you'll have. What have you been doing? Comfort is often the enemy of being faithful to the kingdom. And you don't have to be rich to be comfortable. Not in North American terms, anyway, even though those of us who are middle class are wealthier than 99% of most other people in the world. Wealth and comfort. Wealth can bring comfort, and comfort can lull you to sleep. And you can turn around and decades have passed and you call yourself a Christian, but what have you done to expand God's kingdom? And what are you going to do on Judgment Day when you see the scars that Jesus kept for himself going to the cross to save you? And what have you done? How many people have you shared the faith with? How many people have you told about your own testimony and your own faith in King Jesus? How many? Now, don't get me wrong, because I know that some of you have done this very, very well. I know, I know some of you in this church who have invited everybody you know to, to come to church, people who don't have a church home, you've invited them two or three times. Some of them show up one time, they don't come back. And you're like, ugh, that's okay. That's okay because you're being faithful. You're being faithful. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Just be faithful. You don't know what's going on there. You don't know the seed you may be planting. You don't know. You just don't know. I've been, some people I've begged to go to church for years and they move away, and lo and behold, they send me a message saying, 
hey, I started going to church because you know what? You said to me a long time, really, da, da, da. you don't know. Keep sharing the faith. Keep inviting people who don't have a church home to church. Share your gospel testimony with them. Be faithful, even in quarantine. Record your own testimony, how you came to faith. Put it on Facebook. Take this live stream. Share it. Hopefully somebody who doesn't have faith will come to faith through it. We don't know how much time we have. We are called to be faithful, whatever that is. That's what Jesus is saying here. Be faithful. In the face of persecution, the temptation of comfort, be faithful. Be faithful. And understand what's at stake here. Because those who deny the Holy Spirit, well, they will not receive grace at Judgment Day. Now, I know that we live in a culture that celebrates beauty, fame, and fortune. And we've been there for a long, long time. We look at people with great bodies and big check accounts, and we want to be just like them. That's where we're at. And, but the thing is this, how long does that last? You know, the people who were famous when I lived in California, the people then that were at the top of their game, the best directors and writers and producers and so forth, 90% of them I could rattle off, most people under 30, 35 would go, who? Hasn't even lasted a couple decades. Let me run a name by you that you may have never heard of. His last name was Borden. He was born into a wealthy family. Now, it was not the Borden milk folks. His father became rich through farming and through mining and cattle and, and, and so forth. And he, some, his first name really was William. Megan reminded me of that last time, though, though people called him other names. But William Borden came to Christ as a teenager at a revival meeting in downtown Chicago. He was about 15, 16 years old. And when he came to faith, he really came to faith. He shared the gospel with everyone he knew. There just wasn't enough for him to do. He went off to Yale University and he refused to join a fraternity there, even though he was the big man on campus. He was the most popular person. Big, tall, good-looking, wealthy, great student. But he, re he rejected the fraternity system because they tended to pick the wealthy kids, and he did not want to separate himself from the poorer ones. He telegraphed, because this is back in the early 20th century, he telegraphed his mother and said, Mother, I need some of my, some of my inheritance, some of the stuff that's in my trust fund. Uh, I need it. And his mother figured, well, he's at Yale University. He's big man on campus. Maybe he wants a new car. Maybe he wants a new wardrobe. So she sent him a bunch of money. He didn't, do any, he didn't buy any of those things. He purchased a building in downtown New Haven, Connecticut, and started a homeless ministry there, soup kitchen, and where he would go and serve food and pray with the people who lived on the streets of New Haven, Connecticut. A visitor from Oxford University came to Yale University, spent some time there, returned back to Oxford, and his colleague said, what was the greatest thing you saw in America? He said, the greatest thing I saw was a good-looking millionaire praying on his knees with his arm around a bum. That was William Borden. 
William Borden went to seminary at Princeton University, much to the chagrin of his father, who wanted him to take over the family business. But he had prayed and prayed and prayed and was convinced that with whatever time he had, he would dedicate it to missions. And the money he did have available, he gave away to missions. And after he graduated with his Bachelor of Divinity from Princeton, he set sail for Cairo to learn Arabic and to become a missionary. His mother got on a steamer and crossed the Atlantic to go see him. When she got there, she found that he had died. He had contracted cerebral meningitis at the age of 26 and passed away. But here's what she found. He took notes in his Bible. He would often put down the dates next to the notes. On the date that his father had told him that he was going to yank all of his inheritance, take away all of his money if he went into ministry, he wrote next to that date, no reserve. On the date that he set sail for Cairo in his Bible, he wrote, no retreat. And she found that on the day he died, he wrote, no regrets. William Borden, dead at 26, but in the 10 years or so that he was a Christian, he was faithful and accomplished more for the kingdom of God than some of us could in a hundred years, or some of us will in a hundred years, not could. No reserve, no retreat, no regrets. And you're about to pass from this life to the next. Can you say that? I'm not sure I can say that this morning, but I hope to. Hardly anyone listening to this, watching this, knows who William Borden is. So by our standards, I guess he was a loser, but I tell you this, in eternity, where it really matters, he's a hero. Let's pray. Father God, I pray first and foremost for all those people out there who have been quarantined and just, we pray for their spiritual lives and their emotional stability and health. We pray for an end to this pandemic, but that your will would be done. Pray for all the essential workers who are still out there working hard. We pray that we'll be able to welcome everyone back here soon and worship together soon without fear. But in the meantime, whether it's by phone, by Facebook, by text, And eventually in person, we would not fear people, but only fear you. May we resolve to live every single day with eternity in mind so that we become such servants that we can truly say, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. May we be faithful in whatever time we have, because it's all that matters. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, Christ Community Church, that's all I've got uh, for you now. We will push on through the rest of chapter 12 next week, Lord willing. And so in the meantime, again, be sure to tune in, Facebook Live on Monday night, Zoom for the women's prayer and devotional on Tuesday, and Zoom for the men's uh, devotional and prayer on Wednesday, and mom's uh, Bible study, women's Bible study on Thursday via Zoom, and then Andrew's class with the youth group on Friday. Be sure to share this service 
and to be praying for everyone during this pandemic, especially those who don't know Jesus. Be praying that this stream or whatever church's stream where they believe the Bible and believe the gospel will find its way to those who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you out there, if you've heard the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of, of all of those who had come to faith in him, and you, that, you want to come to faith, you, then please, again, email me at pastormattr at yahoo.com. God bless you. God goes with you. As my wife likes to say, be bold this week. See you. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.